Biobalance HealthCast episode 188, Hair Loss as a Side Effect of Hormone Replacement. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. This week, Kathy and I are going to continue a conversation that we began in a recent podcast about the difference between guideline-based medical approaches to problem solving and uh, personalized medicine interventions and how the, the systems of medicine have evolved with respect to those two ways of thinking. Okay. And so we thought it would be beneficial to take a specific example of a concern that, that women have uh, and talk about how doctors understand and approach trying to solve that concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, And especially in a field that Kathy is in, which is specializing in hormone replacement, particularly testosterone replacement for women, which is the subject of our book, uh, that is not an established, anchored, long-term uh, category of medical knowledge, and, and uh, it's something new under mm-hmm. the sun. And so they don't have these measured, established guidelines that everybody has to follow because that's the way it's always been done. Mm-hmm. It's something new. And every time you do it, you have to look at the individual patient and say, is this an uh, appropriate thing to do with you? Mm-hmm. And if it is, what are the cost-benefit ratios? What kind of side effects might there be? And how do we manage those? And if those were there, would you choose as the patient to take the risk of that side effect mm-hmm. in order to achieve this benefit? Or would you not? And and as a doctor, would I recommend that mm-hmm. you try this? Or would I recommend that you not? And so one of the possibilities is that women who replace testosterone can suffer for hair growth and mm-hmm. can suffer hair loss. Right. So obviously in our world, women are extremely concerned about beauty mm-hmm. and attractiveness and presentation of <clears throat> self. And, and rightly so. so and so they're worried I am about as hair. Well. Yeah. So talk to me about hair loss or hair gain in women who take <laughs> testosterone. Well the the biggest risk that I talk to women about when they take when they embark on taking testosterone is that when you take testosterone, if you had facial hair or acne Mm -hmm. when you were young and your testosterone was at its peak, then when I replace your testosterone, you're you're likely to have facial hair and acne again. So for for long term or just in the beginning or well usually well it could be long term but we but if they tell me that they used to have facial hair and acne, I mean I had tons of facial hair when I was, I mean, I'm Italian. When I was a kid, when I was young, I mean, it was like, it was a joke. I mean, it was like my big fat Greek wedding. You know, we were always bleaching it or ripping it off with wax or something like that. And, and so it was part of my genetic makeup to have a lot of facial hair and a unibrow and that kind of thing. And as I got older and as I, I assume as testosterone levels dropped, I got to the point where I had like no facial hair and I never had acne, but it it depends on where your receptor sites are for testosterone. But I did have a lot of the facial hair. So when I embarked on testosterone and my uh, doctor, Gino Tatera, said, oh, you might get some facial hair. I said, so what? I always had it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, okay, so what do we do about it? He said, but if you take spironolactone and there's some things that we do ahead of time in people who tell me that they had facial hair or acne before that we do to prevent facial hair and acne from coming back. And and so I did that. So I have very little comparatively of what I had when I was young, but that's one of the risks. And some people have, when we give them testosterone enough to make them not tired and, and to have their sex drive back. And sometimes the receptor sites that are in their facial, facial area in their hair follicles actually respond more um, assertively, and they get more facial hair. So we can you always use a medication called finasteride. If it's unacceptable, they can wax it. They don't have to do any of these medications, but we can use spironolactone. We can use finasteride, or we can have them wax wax. But an acne is a, a whole different deal. But spironolactone works well. But, for but that. there's also a huge range of possible outcomes. I mean, a woman who takes that may get a little 
right. acne or a little hair growth, or right. she may become the Chewbacca of middle-aged Italian women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so if that is a concern, you can, I if can you know that in advance, something. you can deal with that. Right. And then, and so that's, that's one of the things that we talk about because it's, it's much more common than any of the other side effects that we would assume is testosterone based. Okay. And those are pretty much a slam dunk. Those, I don't have to like go through a bunch of diagnoses to say, oh, facial hair and acne within a few months of starting testosterone, that's pretty much an A to B. Yeah. Now, we also have a side effect sometimes and very rarely, and that is the side effect of hair loss. Yeah. And But hair loss can be from so many different reasons. This is not an A to B. This is something that when we when we see it, we think the same thing at first as we do with facial hair. If we the same um, medications block hair loss on your head as block facial hair growth on your face. So this is where you blend the guideline systems, where you talk about guidelines. I mean, generally, if if we see this hair loss, mm -hmm. we go down this checklist mm -hmm. and see if these things are if these existing. Things, if these things but, work. But the approach is still personalized medicine because you're problem solving in terms of how do we make an improvement and also what's the cost-benefit ratio so right. that you and the patient make the choice. That's and not right. just you or the drug company or the insurance company. Or <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's basically it on patient's history, her previous history when she was when she had, was at the peak of her testosterone production, right. her genetic history, and and what's happening right now, and then also when we treat with these few things in the very beginning and we get resolution, right? Then we're like, okay, so that worked, we're fine, and then if it doesn't work, that's where we go, okay. This may be from something else. So, so let's talk about the first thing you do, because it, it goes mm -hmm. back to another conversation that we have pretty regularly. Doctors today, because of the requirements for electronic medical record keeping, are more and more being taught, look at the computer screen and fill out the forms <laughs> as you go through so that your record keeping satisfies all the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. you always say, first thing I do is turn away from the computer and actually look at the patient. Right. So the patient comes in and says, I'm having this hair loss that I've not had before. Mm -hmm. You look at their head. Yeah. You yeah. Know, assuming and it's a, a head hair loss. Yeah. And so in general, that's what they're concerned about. Yeah. That's what women are concerned about. Okay. And so I look at the, the physical, this is part of the physical exam, but I look at this part because if you have hair loss like right here in the front and you're a female, like that part of your head. That's usually from not enough estrogen. So I can adjust the estrogen level if, if the patient's able to take estrogen, mm -hmm. okay? So estrogen controls this area on a woman's head. Then if they have hair loss at their temples and right at the crown of their head, like a circle I have that. right here. Yeah, I know. That's male hair loss, male that pattern <laughs> hair loss. And that does have to do, see, male. Yeah. So that does have to do with testosterone turning into dihydrotestosterone and, and its effect on the hair follicles there. And then we have to implement something else, change dosage. Sometimes we increase the estrogen to testosterone ratio, and that helps that too. So there are ways that we can treat that. But then the hair loss that's all over your head, that's thyroid. So it has nothing to do with testosterone. It's now, when you say thyroid head, you don't mean a patch here and a patch no, here. No, I mean... You mean like when you get out of the shower out. and you look back yeah, and, and there's a bunch it's like who's been in my shower. Right, but it's not like you see patches. Right. Okay, so it's all over. Mm -hmm. So that in general is, is either thyroid, low thyroid, or high cortisol. Okay. So if you're really stressed and your cortisol's sp spiking all the time, right. then high cortisol can make your hair thin all over your head. Okay. Then um, the last the last type or the last pattern of hair loss is pattern in like circles of moth eaten. You know, you get like circles of baldness. Okay. Kind the like rest a dog of your that has the mange. Right. It's the good. rest of your hair is growing. Right. But you get these patches right. around you know around your head and and there's no hair in that area. So it's an area where it, it's just completely you can just see like skin. So that's generally, and I'm not giving you a diagnosis, but that's generally 
alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune uh, disease where you attack your own hair follicles. I'm laughing because I have a son who's 43, and when he was about 12 or 13, he started having that. And we took him to the dermatologist, and <laughs> the dermatologist looks at him. He says, oh, he's got an alopecia areata. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, he's losing his hair. But I'm like, Okay, help me here. But it's not he's losing his hair. I mean, he's yeah. losing he's losing it because his own immune system's attacking his hair follicles. Yeah. So, it's a different kind of hair loss. Just because somebody's on testosterone doesn't mean they're not going to get any of these other hair loss issues. Right. So, obviously, that's that's a problem explaining that and trying to get that through, but in this case, they need a dermatologist. I mean, in many of these cases, you know, after I've got the hormones managed, if there's some other issues, a dermatologist who will do a biopsy of their scalp and have it looked at under the microscope will tell whether it's alopecia areata or whether it's testosterone, too much testosterone decrease the dose or whether it's something else. There are Mm -hmm. other things that can cause hair loss. So, So it's by physical exam and then by biopsy, but it's also by changing treatments and seeing if that stops. Well, but then you talk about differential diagnosis and that there are other things that as you go down the decision Mm -hmm. matrix or the decision tree Mm -hmm. and you eliminate, well, it's not testosterone, it's not... uh, Too little estrogen, it's not too little thyroid, it's not too much cortisol. So what are the other things then that you look at that you talk to these women and say, well, this Mm -hmm. could be... Because obviously, we've done one new thing, we put hormones in me, now my hair's falling out, it's got to be the testosterone. And the answer is, well, we'll check that first. We'll check that first, and we'll check but your estrogen. But we don't find that. And then the other hormones that I mentioned. Right. So we all, that's easy Thyroid because that's all, that's all blood work. Right. And we check where the hair is being lost and okay. in what pattern. Right. Then um, we also check for things like, um, proge- well, progesterone is not something that necessarily causes your hair to fall out, but it doesn't help it grow. And progestin, like Provera, uh-huh. causes your hair to fall out. <laughs> Okay. So I try to stay away from that, and that's in some birth control pills. So a lot of people, th- and that's hair loss all over. So progestin sometimes causes your hair to thin. Well, but you also recommend that people don't take testosterone if they're taking birth control pills. Right, right. So I try, but to, in my especially group. for younger women, they have to make a decision. That right. cost-benefit ratio again. If you think you're going to try to have babies, you got to not do the testosterone. Until you're done. Until you're finished trying to have babies. Right. And then if you're taking t- uh, birth control, pills for birth control because you're still fertile, right. then decide on a uh, a more permanent birth control or use a Mirena IUD, which right. will then stop ovulation and stop uh, conception. So use something that's not hormonal. Yes. So um, a lot of people used to take something called Depo-Provera for birth control, mm-hmm. and their hair fell out and they gained weight. So a Provera, Depo Provera, that that's something that I would see in their history and say, mm-hmm. well, we're not, we can't do that. They usually wouldn't be in my office for that. Now, mm-hmm. polycystic ovaries, those patients are always, they always talk about how their testosterone is so high, but it's really the androgens from their adrenal gland and an overactive adrenal gland. Mm-hmm. It's also insulin resistance. So in polycystic ovary patients, they usually have uh, a very, very thin hair, very fragile hair. Uh, and we check them for the other things that happen with polycystic ovaries, like thyroid. And we, we check them for the other androgens from, from the adrenal gland. But we also try to make their hormones more normal. And if they have insulin resistance, which is prediabetes, which makes you have high, high blood sugar and then really low blood sugar, kind of up and down all day, uh, then we try to treat that, and that's tr- that's treated with metformin. So that's one of the medications that helps hair so grow. So they're not on insulin, and, and they may or may not be classified as truly diabetic, but if they have those fluctuation issues... We used to call it hypoglycemia. Okay. But it's really insulin resistance or prediabetes, and that's very common in poly- polycystic ovarian disease. And metformin is a pill mm-hmm. that you can take two or three times a day to stabilize that fluctuation? Right. It stabilizes the insulin resistance. It actually makes the cells of your body, including hair follicles, Mm -hmm. more porous to insulin. Insulin carries in blood sugar, and so it helps cause energy. Energy is needed to grow hair. Right. So it actually helps hair growth to become more sensitive to insulin. Okay. Okay? So so that's So it's all these interactive systems that you have to know. That's right. And 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 there's so many different things that can... Guideline checklists... 
and personalized medicine where you're looking at this individual saying, yeah, let, let's experiment with you. And a lot of the times I know the patient has PCO or I know what they, you know, they've had low thyroid or they've had autoimmune diseases, right. things like that. So I know that about them. And so then I hone in more on the things that are theirs. But yeah. right now we're going down the list of all the things all that, that it could, could be. be. Right. And it's not just, it's not just testosterone. It goes, right. I mean, this goes for men's hair loss as well, but, um, there's a, a genetic, we always talk about testosterone levels are, are part of the picture, but receptor sites are the other part. So many people have very sensitive receptor sites in their hair follicles. Those are usually the people that when they were young, they had women that had lots of hair on their arms, you know, and they had lots of fuzz on their face or, or even mustache and think, lots of, you know, the unibrow and lots of just sensitivity to uh, testosterone. So those patients that have receptor sites that are genetically programmed to be very sensitive to testosterone, I may give them a dose that would be, wouldn't affect anybody else, but that person is going to lose hair and get facial hair and get hairy all over. So you would give them a lower dose I give that them normally a lower wouldn't dose. trigger the responses in mm -hmm. other people, but because they have so many receptor sites or, or receptor sites that have heightened sensitivity, mm -hmm. that you give them a lower amount and that that wakes up all those sites mm -hmm. and they get the dose that somebody else wouldn't get. Right. And in the meantime, we try to block the receptor mm -hmm. sites with finasteride. Okay. Which is a medication that you can take as a pill. So we use that to try to, to block any so more loss. So it's a bal balancing effect. Right. That's right. So um, we also find that obesity, especially over 30 BMI, you know, when you figure out your BMI, 25 and below is healthy, 30 and above is, is obese. So that being obese causes you to have high inflammation in your body, causes you to have insulin resistance. So it usually incorporates a lot of these other more minor causes of hair loss and puts them together into one picture. So you all, I mean, if you look around, you see a lot of obese people with very thin hair. And that if they lost weight, if they use metformin to, to become more insulin sensitive, if they got their thyroid checked and treated, all of those things would help them grow better hair. Yeah. So, so it's still a significant ingredient in all of this are the lifestyle choices of the individual. Yes. I mean, I, yes. obesity is not necessarily a lifestyle choice, but no. there's a reflection of right. diet and exercise mm -hmm. and smoking and drinking. And okay. Well, let's go to smoking. Smoking. All right. All right. Sm that's, smoking. That's on our list. <laughs> smoking is, is, is a really bad, <laughs> it's a really bad thing for your hair because it, it's hypoxia. It's like breathing carbon monoxide. You wouldn't sit in your garage and, and breathe, breathe what your car is putting out. But that's what you're doing to your body when you're smoking a cigarette. And it causes hair loss. Are you People who smoke lose hair, and they have fragile hair, and they don't grow it back. Back when they did smoking commercials on television, they still do it. I was watching a movie over oh, Memorial Day, a, a war movie that they were showing, filmed in the early 1950s, and everybody was smoking. Uh -huh. And a lot of them would just let the smoke drool out of their mouth, and it would just, like, <laughs> circle their head, you know. And uh, I remembered when I was teaching high school, I used to have a poster on the wall, and it was this old, haggard woman with, with no her teeth. face was, <laughs> but her face was like leatherized, and her hair was real straw, and and and, and it said, "Smoking is glamorous." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? and that's and that's what it does. It's yeah, really it's like hard tanning your skin and yeah, and it's hard killing it's, your hair. It's hard to make your uh, it's it's when you are in a hypoxic atmosphere. It's hard to heal. It's hard to grow anything. It's hard. You need oxygen. We all need oxygen, and that's just like taking it away. So. That's that's one of the choices that you can make that is has nothing to do with medicines. You can just not smoke. I mean, or not live with a smoker or make them smoke outside. So there are other things that people don't know about the medications. Like somebody will be on, Tell that to my eighty five year old aunt say, you have to go outside and smoke. Uh well she's probably not going out of her house, so you have to be yeah, you can Actually be outside. I have said that to her. She's, <laughs> she doesn't come as often as she I used bet to. she doesn't. But I'm sure it's because she's older. <laughs> Okay, so our um, medic, your own, your own social issues. You know, no, we have to keep. They're talking. always there. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, take the boy out of the country. Medications. There are many medications that cause your hair to fall out. I'm on one of these, and it, it does, has made an impact on my hair. But oftentimes, people will be on 
testosterone and then they come in and I like they're like I've been on testosterone for 10 years and all of a sudden my hair's falling out. Oh, and so after looking through these other things, thyroid and hormones, then I have to look at their med list. Right. And so it, because I'm not the doctor that memorizes the med list, I have to actually look at it. So Many blood pressure medicines like metaprolol or any of the beta blockers yeah. that like slow your heart down cause you to lose hair on your head. Interesting. So that's that's not good. Um, this is something I give. But that's one of those cost benefit things. You, you want to have a heart attack or do you want to lose some hair? No, I mean I still take it. Yeah. Because I have because to. You have to. There's no other alternative. Right. But if there was an alternative that didn't cause my hair to fall out, yes, I would choose that. Right. Um, we use aromatase inhibitors a lot in um, in what we do because we have a very high population of people who genetically make estro- estrone, old lady estrogen, out of their testosterone. Okay. So okay. so for them to lose weight, for them to be healthy, for them not to have painful breasts. We use uh, Arimidex, which is an aromatase inhibitor. It stops the conversion of testosterone into estrone. However, too much of a good thing is sometimes not a good thing. Right. So when we get rid of so much of that estrone, then their hair doesn't grow very well. So we have to decrease that dose. So oftentimes we have to ratchet it back and then allow them to make some estrone. A little is okay. A lot is not. And so allow that process to go through for their hair to grow. So that is that is a drug interaction with hair. So that's one that we have to discuss. Of course, chemotherapy can make your hair all fall out, mm-hmm. kills the follicles, usually comes, I mean, doesn't kill them forever, but uh, poisons them. Hair falls out, and then it comes back, sometimes a different color and texture. PTU, which is a, is a thyrouracil that we use for um, pro, pro oh God, propyl thyro, thyrouracil. Sometimes you use these and act. Anac- an acronym so right. long that you don't remember the name of the real drug. Right. It's used for hyperthyroidism, and this is something that um, often calls, causes hair loss uh, at the hair follicle level. Corticosteroids, medrol dose packs. Oftentimes, somebody will have had an IV bag full of steroids for some reason. It could be asthma. It could be an autoimmune disorder. It could be anything, and their hair all falls out. And that's a corticosteroid reaction. That is not testosterone. Right. And that's all over their heads. Cholesterol-lowering drugs like Lipitor decrease uh, hair growth because they don't have enough cholesterol. Goes to, makes brain, makes hair, makes so everything. So all, all of these medicines you're talking about, though, are prescription meds. Yeah, they're, they're all not prescription over the counter meds. things that people no. buy. Uh-uh. So okay. Prilosec, Lupron, Provera, radiation for cancer. All of those things mm-hmm. can cause hair loss, and there's even there's even more, but these are the primary uh, problems. But, but the point I was making with that is this is not going to be something that's going to surprise you or the patient. I mean, they know they've had these treatments or taken these medicines. But they don't know they, they cause hair loss. With you, but if they so share that's that why with I have you to ask. when you ask what, what's been happening medically. What's new? Yeah. What have you been treated with? What drugs? Right. And, and oftentimes... That's not first on their list. They're not right. thinking that. No, they're not. So we have to go through the list and say, have you have you taken any of these? If you have, then we need to find an alternative or we need to expect less hair growth. Yeah. Or we need to try to make it grow a different way, try to manipulate something else, like use more estrogen or even make sure the thyroid level is at the top of normal and not the middle, you right. know, so that that would make more hair. So we have to manipulate things. But um, the last couple things, one is a lack of appetite or nutrition. Some some patients starve themselves to lose weight. And if you do that, you're likely to lose hair. I mean, I remember doing that in high school when I wanted to lose weight and I went a summer and I drank, I mean, I was not a doctor then, so don't judge me, but I drank Fresca, ate eggs and lettuce all summer. Well, I became a complete anorexic looking person and my hair all fell out. It was a lot of horrible. A lot of wrestlers (laughs) who try to drop several pounds for meat, uh, a lot of cheerleaders, a lot of swimmers and girls with anorexia nervosa all manifest. Bulimia as well. Hair issues. Yeah. Uh, if and they, they get go this so tiny baby into, hair because they're not yeah. eating enough nutrition. Mm-hmm. Fuzz all Fuzz. over. Fuzz. Yeah. And all over. Lanugo is what they call it. All over their bodies, but not on their heads. Mm-hmm. Sometimes veganism, if you're, a, if you're a vegan or if you're a vegetarian and you don't replace all the amino acids that your body can't make, mm-hmm. then you'll have <laughs> hair loss. Um, r- rapid weight loss um, 
is bad too because it releases from your fat a lot of toxins and the toxins go to the hair. And so that's sometimes an issue. Uh, lack of B vitamins and lack of and, and low fat diets because you need to have fat to make hair. So high protein, low fat diets. High protein is good, but the low fat is not. Um, so, so at the end of the day then, what we're saying is there are, it's not the most common problem out there, but there are problems for some women with hair growth or hair loss. And rather than just quickly assume, oh, it's because of testosterone, I shouldn't be taking testosterone, come in and talk about it and look at your overall health patterns and issues to see if it's not being caused by something that you don't think of. And right. it can be adjusted so that you can still retain the benefits of the testosterone replacement. Right. I think it's very important to have us look at your head. Yeah. Because and, and, and then I've also had people who are sure they're going to have hair loss. And then I look at their head and there's right. it looks perfect. And the, then if they want me to wait a couple months and I'll wait and look at it again, I'll even take pictures of it if they so, want to show the difference. And that's an awesome tool to be able to show this is what it looked like two months ago. This mm-hmm. is what it looks like now. What do you see? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it all goes back to what Kathy says on a regular basis. It's about personalized medicine. It's about having a relationship with your doctor who spends the time to talk to you and look at you mm-hmm. and then together with you make informed decisions. It is mm-hmm. so important that you become an informed consumer about your medical health care. So hopefully these two podcasts that we've done on guideline-based medicine and problem-solving-based medicine will help put you in the position to be a more informed consumer. As always, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.